Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 277, featuring the second installment of my interview with Ed Freeze, the former head of Microsoft Game Studios. This part of the interview, we talk about the sort of uh, cunning pranks that went on at Microsoft while Ed was there. Some really hilarious, way over the top stuff you're not going to believe. Uh, we also talk about some of the Easter eggs that they uh, stuck into some of the uh, otherwise uh, boring <laughs> productivity uh, packages like Excel and Word, much more. Some pretty cool stuff there. Uh, then we get into the uh, his transition to the game studio and uh, Halo and the development of the Xbox. Anyway, lots of great, great stuff in this episode. So without further ado, here is Mr. Ed Freeze. I'm kind of curious about these uh, the East, all these Easter eggs. You know, they always get brought up. You know, with the Excel, the, the fireworks and the, the pinball, I guess, or the flight sim. But there yeah. was one that I, I was listening to this interview, and they didn't ask you about this, but you said that there, you, you created an Easter egg that was based on a dream. <laughs> wow. Yeah, okay, I kind of want to follow that up. So what was this dream, and what was the the Easter our egg dream, question? So our, our enemy, so basically, the, the short version of my time on Excel was I was – the youngest programmer on the team, uh, the first version of Excel for Windows, uh, Excel 2.0. Um, that was seven of us. The group grew to about 16, and we did the next version of Excel. Then the group grew to about 50. And by then, I was the lead programmer, technical lead. Um, and uh, anyway, and we were battling Lotus 123. Lotus, as a company, was bigger than all of Microsoft. Lotus 123 was the most popular piece of microcomputer software in the world. And, you know, there was a small team of us trying to beat them. Microsoft was smaller than Lotus, so it was, it was a big battle um, and an important battle. Anyway, so they were just our enemy. We were totally focused on Lotus and beating Lotus. And, um, yeah, so, I don't know. One day I had a dream, and in the dream there was a box of 1, 2, 3, and it started shaking, and then it broke apart and bugs crawled all out of it. It was crawling all over with bugs. <laughs> and, uh, and so that became the Easter egg in one of the versions of Excel, was recreating that dream as a little, little animated sequence in Excel. Wow. <laughs> the story has been told. <laughs> there, the story has been told. I saw you describe this time as like an Ender's Game experience. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, I guess you did have the three siblings, but you were the... It's not totally fair. I, 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 did that, <laughs> I did that kind of for fun because I wanted to sort of frame the entire thing. But it was, actually a really, it was actually a really great time in my life. I worked with some incredibly smart people. I learned so much about programming. And we had a lot of fun, too. The, um, you know, like every time I went on vacation, I would come back and they would have trashed my office in some way. And they were like, the first one, which you can find on the internet if you look really hard, was because I was pretty known for the fish stuff back then. They covered my entire office floor with Dixie cups filled with water and they made a giant fish uh, with food coloring. But they used the paper cups, not the plastic cups. And so it leaked. Oh. And so my whole, so it kind of like stained my whole carpet in my office. But it made this with a kind of a cool fish pattern, so it was okay. <laughs> but uh, uh, but uh, also back then, you're just getting old days stories. Sorry about that. But um, I was, I started to, um, when, you're, when you're a programmer, you have a lot of spare time. Uh, especially back then, because you would make some changes and then you'd compile and it would take about 10 minutes before you could test. That's why programmers in general, you know, they all know how to juggle. Um, you know, uh, we used to lock pick a lot, so we, I, I can pick a lock pretty well. Uh, it was just anything to, you know, keep busy while you were waiting for those 10 minutes. But, one of the, you know, I was a, always a struggling golfer, so one of the things I did was I brought a, a, a little plastic hole and some golf balls and a putter in, and I'd practice putting. And uh, late, and we would work late. Late one night, I was out practice, practicing putting, and one of the guys said, "Why don't you just try to go all the way 
around the hall. And I said, what do you mean? We were in these big X-shaped buildings, so they were like this and like this. And, and, so, and the X was really long. I mean, you'd just see offices disappearing into the distance. And so it was like, instead of putting this way, what if you put that way and go all the way around and back to the beginning? It's like, oh, I don't know. Is that even possible? So took the putter back and swung as hard as I could and hit it way down the hall. And uh, we were wondering, what's the shortest number of strokes you could do that in? You know, it turned out to be about five if you really hit it really well. Um, anyway, started really informally. Then people started to show up and want to play. Um, uh, and rules developed around it. And it became this event called the Swing Around the Wing. Uh, within, within about a year, it evolved into something where every Friday night I would organize tea times. Uh, I'd get about 50 or 60 people showing up, send them out in groups of kind of 6 to 10. Once one group was all the way down around the corner, I could send out the next group. And we would play golf for a couple hours in the hallway. And, um, you know, you had to play the ball where it lied. It would roll under people's desks or on people's chairs or down the stairs. And then you had to hit it in the elevator and come back up. And um, Anyway, it was, it was a big event. Um, there was a... We started with just a tiny little trophy that was a Gumby, like this big, and then every year, it add, we, every time, whoever won that week got the Gumby, but then they, add, they had to add something to it for the next week. So pretty soon it grew into this giant, massive trophy called the Gumbopolis. Anyway. <laughs> the Gumbopolis? <laughs> yeah, it had blinking lights and stuff stuck all over it oh, and everything. Wow. But people from all over the company played, and um, anyway, we, we had... This, so many great stories from that time, but that's a whole other chapter. Was playing golf in the hallway. So yeah, that sounds, it's, you know, fascinating to me. When you think about Microsoft, I guess most people probably think about this really boring sort of office <laughs> space-like world. But I guess in reality, everybody's joking, having a good time, playing golf. I think I, you know, uh, Becky uh, Berger Heinemann. I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had her on, and she was talking about this M and M tradition they have there. Oh, I don't know Where's, what that is. Uh, something about her on your birthday, you, you bring so many pounds of M&Ms for every year you've worked at Microsoft. Oh, that's a, that's going to be different by different groups. But <laughs> so each I mean, group, I guess, had their own traditions. The thing about Microsoft back then was, I don't know, maybe it's kind of like Google today. And Google, I mean, it was very much a re rebellious culture and. And we, you know, for us, the big boring company was IBM, you know, those are the ones we made fun of and didn't want to be. Um, and we were the young punk hacker kids making this cool stuff. So kind of different than maybe today's image of the company, but lots of good times. All right. So you were, I guess, doing pretty well with Excel, you know, working on that project, but you decided at some point to move into games. And at the time, it seems as Seems like you were, you wanted to do it, but at the same time, you were a little worried. Or... So I worked on Excel for five years. I had a great boss, a guy named Chris Peters, and then he went over to run Word. We had pretty much won the battle with Lotus 1, 2, 3. We were now leading them, but we were still getting really beat on word processors by a company called WordPerfect. And so since Chris had had success in this battle with Excel, they promoted him over Word. He immediately had a fight with the development manager on Word, and then the development manager quit, and he asked me if I would come over and be development manager for Word, which was the next step up for me after technical lead. It meant I was managing a team of 60 people working for a boss that I really liked, so I agreed. I went over to Word. I worked on Word for another five years battling Word Perfect, and we battled Word Perfect and beat them. And by then, Office was a pretty established thing. And, and yeah, then, then they came to me and they said, um, you know, you've done well. We think the next thing for you to do is to run a business. Anyway, um, so they said we should run a business, and, uh, but w wasn't sure what business I should run. They suggested some. But there were really only two things I liked to do. I liked programming and I liked video games. I mean, I would go home at night and play all the latest games, right? So, so it turned out at that same time that the head of Microsoft's kind of start fledgling game business, which was pretty small, this flight simulator and not too much else, had just left the company. And so there was an opening. 
And so I said, hey, I want to go run this business. If I'm going to run a business, why not do it in an area I have history and a passion for, you know? And I immediately got hauled into multiple vice president's offices and they told me I was committing career suicide and why would you leave office, one of the most important parts of the company, to go work on something nobody cares about? Told me stuff like that. Um, but I ignored them and put my foot down and said, oh, this is what I really want to do. And so they sighed and said, rolled their eyes and said, fine, go ahead, go do your game thing. Uh, destroy your career. We don't care. Um, and so then I went off um, to build Microsoft's game business. And it was really nice because nobody did care. Um, it was like my island in this big company, which was getting more and more bureaucratic at that time, bigger and more bureaucratic. And I was off with a small team doing something without a lot of interference. Um, Flight Simulator was making money. And as long as my group was making money, nobody really cared what I was doing. And so we just started signing more games. Uh, we had teamed up with a little company called Ensemble Studios out of Dallas, Texas, to publish their first game, a game called Age of Empires. Um, I was a big Dune 2 and, you know, uh, Command and Conquer fan. And so to work on a real-time strategy game, I was excited about. Age of Empires came out, was a big, big hit for us. Uh, that brought more money into the group. Um, using that money, started to grow the group more, started to do acquisitions, bought a company called uh, FASA Interactive, Jordan Weissman, an old friend of mine, brought him out. Um, MechWarrior. MechWarrior, Crimson Skies, many other things. Um, and uh, just kept growing the group, grew it up to 300 people, 400 people, started doing pretty well in the PC gaming space. And then, um, and then one day, these DirectX guys walked into my office, and that was the start of a whole new chapter. So, Yeah, I know where you're going with that. I want to just hold that, there, that thought for a second, though. You bet. A couple of things about this period I thought was interesting. One, that I saw you said you almost published EverQuest. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, almost published EverQuest, came very close to buying Blizzard twice. Uh, I was a huge Blizzard fan. Um, yeah, John Smedley, old friend. Um, yeah, so I was a big EverQuest player. Um, Brad McQuaid, uh, again, uh, another old friend. Uh, the producer of EverQuest uh, played from very early on. Um, and they, because they were a part of Sony, they didn't have a way to put out a PC version of this game. And they didn't have their own PC distribution. And so they needed basically a PC publisher. And I was happy to do it. I was a big fan of the game and, and fan of these guys. Um, this was before the console war started, so it, it wasn't as controversial as it sounds. But, um, but in the end, Sony corporate stopped it, if I remember right. Um, and that's why we didn't end up going forward with it. But we were, we were very willing to put out that game. Another little tidbit from this era that I thought was pretty funny. And it's kind of revealing, I think. Yeah. Uh, you know, you were talking about how we had all these 3D games, and that was where all the excitement and the hype was. But in, in actuality, the best seller was this game called Zoo Tycoon. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that seems to be the case a lot of the times. So, you know, what, what, what do you think was going on there? Well, it was a time when uh, 3D accelerators were just starting to come out. And the idea that you could do stuff in 3D graphics, which today we take for granted, uh, back then was it was the revolution. And so, um, yeah, when this team came to me and said they wanted to make this zoo game, the zoo tycoon game that was going to be 2d and i just didn't get it <laughs> but it was some very good people who worked for me had been in the group a long time and you know i told them all my concerns but i was like look i don't believe this is going to work but you know i like you guys i trust you guys you know mostly <laughs> so i'm going to give you some rope you know go off and 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 build this game and we'll see what happens um, but uh, but know going in that I'm skeptical. 
is basically my attitude. And they and they just totally blew me away. I mean, it wasn't our best selling game, but it was a very good selling game for us, very profitable game for us. And uh, yeah, and I think taught me a lesson too about you know kind of chasing trends in the video game business. You know, right now people are super excited about VR and. I don't know. Oh, yeah. I've seen you're kind of skeptical of that <laughs> Oculus just, Rift and all. I mean, you know, I've played a lot of games in my time, as have you. I mean, gameplay ultimately is what matters, not graphics. God, if people could learn anything from Minecraft, you know, it's like, here's, here's a game that is written in Java, you know, which no self respecting game would be at that time. And, uh, you know, it's 16 pixel. Uh, 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 textures and blah blah blah. Anyway, it's uh, it just shows it's all about gameplay. So it ties know, in really super- nicely with the story that you know you're about to tell about the Xbox and the DirectX guys. But you know this this I you know the hardware to get the hype going. They they talk about how you know innovative it is and how the graphics and high speed this and you know polygon counts and all this stuff. But really. You know, it's not going to sell the system, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, an Xbox, well, I don't know, any time in business, it takes some, some luck and some skill. You've got to build a good product. You've got to be in the right place at the right time. And then it takes some luck to really be successful, especially if you're the underdog and you're trying to unseat some people who've been there for a long time. And I've been in a bunch of battles like that. Cell versus Lotus One Two Three, Word versus Word Perfect. Now you know Microsoft versus Sony, and Nintendo, and video games. Intimidating challenge, probably. Um, but um, yeah, I think you know. For me, the luck was when my phone rang, and it was a guy named Peter Tamty, who I knew from the game business, calling me to say that Bungie was going out of business, and they, you know, they were kind of a struggling, mostly Macintosh game developer. And uh, they just couldn't make it on their own anymore. That was a time when a lot of companies were like that. Um, we had acquired Access Software out of Salt Lake, the makers of the Lynx Golf Series and uh, a bunch of other games. Uh, similar situation where they had been self-publishing and it just became an era where little developers couldn't self-publish anymore. Um, anyway, yeah, so, wow, that was great. I mean... Xbox had just been approved and now here's a developer I have a lot of respect for who's developing this new first person shooter called Halo and uh, I desperately need something like that in my portfolio so put the deal together uh, it was, and it was a tricky deal to put together because Take-Two already owned a third of the company so I had to get on the phone with Ryan Brandt who's the head of Take-Two at that time and negotiate to kind of split up the company and basically um, I said, all I, all I want is Halo and the development team. You can have everything else. So, um, which at the time, there was a lot of everything else. There was the whole back catalog of all the products they had made in the past. There was also a game called Oni that they were developing with a, a separate team down in California. And so we agreed You guys to, can have Oni. We just, all we want is Halo. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you must have known right away this was going to be this huge thing or... Which, in retrospect, sounds sounds smart, but at the time, you know, it's not at all clear what what's going to happen. Sure. Uh, but um, so we agreed to finish Oni for them, which we did, um, and then moved the team, the, part of the Bungie team from from Chicago out to Seattle, and the other part down from California up to Seattle, um, to focus on making Halo. And they had to build that game basically in less than two years. I mean, they did a phenomenal job. I'm pretty sure um, and, there's some, some viewers that have probably heard of Halo <laughs> and played it. <laughs> yeah, and I think without that game, um, you know, it probably would have been a different different story about what would happen with Xbox. Do you think it's fair to say without Halo there would be no Xbox today? Yeah, I think there probably would not be an Xbox 360, which probably means there would not be a Halo t- or an Xbox today. Yeah, I think that's right. Let's back up a little bit here, because I wanted to get the story about the you know, these guys coming to your office with this you know, direct Xbox. So can you talk a little bit about that? And also I'm curious, because I've read that there was a lot of uh, opposition at Microsoft to the whole idea of a, a game console. 
you know, Apple had tried it. I was at the Pippin. You know, a couple of yeah. other companies had tried it and it hadn't worked out too well. And so, I mean, Sony, Microsoft, big competition. I mean, what was the? Just sort of tell us, walk us through that story. <laughs> I was just in Scotland, and I spent two hours up on stage telling these old stories. So. Oh, well, this is the highlights. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll tell, the juicy I'll tell part the that you version. left out. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, you know, the idea originated in the DirectX team. There's a handful of people who get credit for it. Uh, they came up with the idea of this Direct Xbox, or Xbox for short, um, they came to me because I ran Microsoft's game publishing division. If they wanted games for this box, they needed me. But also there was a big political battle brewing within the company. There was a, a separate, a whole separate team that also wanted to build a game console at this time. And they were uh, mostly a group of ex-3DO people that the company had acquired uh, through, I believe, through Hotmail, actually, when Microsoft bought Hotmail. They came in that way. And they had been involved with Windows CE on the Dreamcast, which probably your viewers understand. But, you know, Dreamcast, there was a way to reboot it in Windows mode, which I don't know why anyone ever would. But, um, but those guys, after they, that project, wanted to go on and build a game console. And so there were two, com two parts within the company, two teams that wanted to build this. And both teams rallied their vice presidents. Uh, and had a big battle with some typical Microsoft style. So I, I teamed up with the DirectX people, the Xbox people, and some other vice presidents uh, teamed up with the other group, and we had a battle all the way up to Bill and Steve, and, and Bill had to choose, and he chose our project, and so their project was canceled. And the main reason he chose our project was because what we were proposing was very much a PC running Windows. Um, I mean, it was literally going to be a PC running Windows at that time. And the other guys were basically building uh, PlayStation 1. Um, and so it was custom hardware, custom OS, all that stuff. So we won the battle, and then we, um, you know, their project got blown up. Some of them came to work for us, but we spent the next year trying to understand what it really meant to be in the console business and we learned that they actually knew a lot more about it than we did and slowly our project shifted more to look more like what they were building less like what we had originally planned and so uh, we dropped windows most notably but um, you know it still was a pc like architecture but it had some differences blah 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 anyway um, all of that culminated in a big meeting called the Valentine's Day Massacre, which I've talked about many times in the past, and you can go see on video or whatever. But the short version is, uh, it was the final meeting, it was held on Valentine's Day, it was the final meeting to approve the Xbox. Uh, it was held in February of 2000, so uh, two years, a little less than two years before the launch of the console. And uh, we all met in the big boardroom, Bill and Steve and everybody, and Bill walked in and was really mad about our plan because he found out that it didn't run Windows, which was kind of the whole reason a year ago he had sided with us and blown up this other team. And so he yelled at us and Balmer yelled at us about how much money we were going to lose and it went back and forth. They yelled at us for hours and hours and hours till late at night on Valentine's Day, which was bad because we were, you know married or had girlfriends and we were all in big trouble back at home and we we're in big trouble at work because we we're getting yelled at for hours and uh, in the end they were really worried about Sony ultimately and um, and so they basically changed their minds they yelled at us for four hours and then changed their minds and in five minutes they were saying we love this plan we're going to support it 100% we're going to give you everything you need go off and make this project you have our full blessing go spend all this money, uh, go and do this. We think it's a really good idea. And we walked out of there just with our heads spinning. And, uh, and uh, I, I turned to Robbie Bach, my, my boss at that time, and just said that was the weirdest meeting I've been in in 14 years at the company. But anyway, that we, got, we got approval to build the Xbox, and they went forward and did it. Uh, it seems that you said that uh, Sony seemed to be the biggest obstacle uh, for the Xbox success. So you weren't worried at all about Nintendo? Or Sega, I guess, at that point was pretty much done, right? We actually met with Nintendo and offered to partner with them early on, but they didn't want to do that. Um, 
So Nintendo was definitely uh, an option. Um, at that time, uh, Sega was shutting down Dreamcast, if I remember right. I may go, have my timing a little wrong. But, so Sega wasn't really a threat to us. Um, Sony was pretty much our focus. Um, Sony you know, had won the previous generation and um, was the company Microsoft was most paranoid about, maybe I'd say, most concerned about, because uh, they were involved in lots of other things beyond just gaming. Um, I think if, if Sony was only doing video game consoles, uh, our project never would have got approved because there wasn't a big enough threat to the company. But Sony represented a threat, at least in Bill and Steve's mind, that they wanted to counter. And part of Xbox was to counter that threat. I mean, that's sort of the corporate strategic reason for doing it. It's not my reason for doing it. I, you know, I wanted to make great games. I was always trying to find resources money basically at Microsoft to give to great developers so we could make more cool games. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with a third installment of my interview with Mr. Ed Freeze. A lot of great stuff coming up. Just uh, getting started really with it, so uh, stay tuned. Oh, as always, I want to thank you very very much if you have supported the show, if you have stepped up to the plate to support Matt Chat. It really means a lot to me, guys. Uh, remember, uh, you can support the show at any amount you feel comfortable with. Just go to the Patreon site, and uh, that'll also get you access to some special uh, podcasts and Google Air Hangouts. I just did a little podcast on uh, Bard's Tale 4 and uh, the generation gap uh, that we're seeing in between uh, gamers nowadays. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? <laughs> oh, I'm not quite sure what to make of these two items. Uh, one is uh, Grim Fandango Remastered has, is up on Steam now. Uh, as you know, I'm a big fan of the original Grim Fandango. I did a match out on it not too long ago. Uh, but I was looking at the reviews. I haven't tried it yet, the remastered version, uh, just because the reviews kind of made me hesitate. Uh, they're talking about how the... Uh, there's just so many bugs in it, and it's really not... <laughs> you, know, you might be better off sticking with the original one. So I don't know what to think of that. I really am going to wait for you guys to let me know if this is something I should uh, invest in or just save my hard-earned cash. Uh, and another one is even more depressing. Uh, Heroes of Might and Magic 3, one of my all-time favorite strategy games. I mean, I played the <laughs> crap out of that game back in the day. I know a lot of you did, too. So I got really excited to see this um, HD edition, uh, high definition graphics, but man, uh, the reviews, uh, again, have just not been uh, good at all for that. They're saying that there's, they actually took out a bunch of the content. There's issues with multiplayer. Um, you're better off just going to good old games and getting the original, which just still plays just fine. So, you know, I don't know if these are kind of exaggerated or, or maybe some of this stuff will be fixed later. But, but again, uh, please let me know if you've tried either one of these uh, games and what you think of, think of them. Because uh, that's kind of depressing. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, maybe to, this will cheer things up. We'll look at this uh, Ale of the Week. Uh, this is a Deschutes River Ale. I'm not quite sure what a river ale is. <laughs> so I thought I'd give this a go. Um, Deschutes Brewery, they're out of, uh, Bend, Oregon. Uh, let's see. This may leave a fine layer of yeast in the bottom of the bottle. Oh, how many problems in life begin with a fine layer of yeast in the bottom? Oh, uh, let's see what else we got here. Ah, here's one that's clean and refreshing enough for the long haul, but fully graced with hop aroma, malt heft, and clear craft passion. Sit back, relax, sit back, relax, and let these subtle pleasures reveal. Somebody having some fun there with the text on the bottle. <laughs> you know, I wonder who comes up with that stuff anyway. And let's see, alcohol. Wow, this is uh, really weak. Only a uh, 4% alcohol. Uh, so that's not even as much as in a Budweiser. So you could probably drink a whole case of this and not get drunk, so. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's okay, though. Let's see. Everywhere since 1988. Anyway, I don't see anything else here uh, really all that remarkable, so let's uh, get this open and see what it's all about. 
All right, so I got some of this uh, Deschutes River Ale here in the rather excellent drinking horn. Then sniffing it. A nice little aroma here. You can smell some hops. It's not really uh, all that pungent, but it's, it's, it smells nice. Uh, let's give it a taste, though. That's a pretty nice flavor. A little bit of hops. It's a uh, very light. Um, you get a little bit of that sort of a malty cornflakes-like uh, taste to it, but it's not bad. I'll try it again. Yeah, it's, it's, it is very light and refreshing, I guess I would say. You know, if it's a hot day, you don't really want to get a buzz. <laughs> you know, you might go for this. Not a whole lot of flavor, though. I'll just try it one more time. Yeah, you know, it's just, it's okay. It's a little light for my taste. Uh, you know, it's not something that I would uh, want to have uh, every day. I usually like a stronger, a more full-bodied ale. Uh, but I guess if you're just getting into ale, <laughs> you're kind of uh, turned away by strong flavor and uh, high alcohol content. This would be a good choice for you. Uh, for me, though, I think I'm going to go, uh, I guess I'll go two out of five drinking horns on this. It's not terrible, uh, just not something that I uh, especially like or would recommend. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I found a... I was looking up for, uh, for quotations from Bill Gates, and I found a really, really good one. I really like this, this quotation here. I thought uh, I would share it with you. It goes something like this. Success is a lousy teacher. It seduces smart people into thinking they can't fail. See you guys next week. Stupid bastard, you've got no arms left. Yes, I have. Look! Just a flesh wound.